Chapter 3, SPF 40 Part 4 of 4 Heat Relentless, oppressive, and omnipresent. The Sahara was known for many things, and mercy was not one of them. Even with the magical sunscreen and decent supply of water, the trek across the burning sands of the Sahara was anything but pleasant. The pounding heat of the mid-afternoon sun pounded away at the ponies. The desert seemed to laugh at Alexia's magic, for the sun did not just press down on them from above. It came at them from every angle imaginable. The sun's rays bounced off the pale dunes around them and slipped under the arrogant shield and pelted the equines with heat that was only compounded by hot sands beneath their hooves. Crimson looked worriedly at the sunscreen. That thing is making me think we're in a pissin oven. As if that were not enough, the inexperienced desert travelers were hammered by wind-blown sand. The gritty coarse particles got everywhere, niggling away at the ponies as they trekked across the endless dune sea. Loki bent her neck to the right and kicked the side of her head to knock some sand out of her ear. I could really use that dune buggy right about now. She turned to Alexia who was trying to just focus on putting one hoof in front of the other. Hey magic mare! got any ice spells by chance. Alexia shook her head. That would be a really bad idea. The others looked at her in disbelief. The dark red-haired earth mare voiced the shared concern. Are you sure the heat's not getting to you? She said ice, not fire. I heard what she said, Toon half-heartedly growled back. She was angry more with herself for crashing and beyond irritated by the sweltering desert that was so hot. No sweat clung to her body. All of it evaporated the moment it left her pores. It was so bad that the metallic invisibility bracelets threatened to cause burns so everyone removed the fetlock burners and set them on top of the camelback. Ice doesn't just come from nowhere, I have to dump the thermal energy somewhere to make ice and that would mean making the air around us even hotter. Wouldn't all this wind blow that heat away? The bleary alicorn looked at Conrad for a few seconds as if regarding him for the first time. The desert was cooking her brain to the point where higher logic was nearly impossible. UMM maybe. She blinked, but her eyes couldn't manage to do them in sync. I didn't think of that. Loki flopped on the ground next to her. Could you do it fast? I'm sorta dying here. Her tongue lolled out of her mouth in an otherwise comical fashion. The green mare's words cut straight through Alexia's sluggishness and terrified her. Toon's synapses started firing again as she saw her mate on the cusp of heat stroke. She dropped the sunscreen to focus on gathering her magic to try and pull the thermal energy out of each pony and send it into the sand and out into the air. The effect was immediate and the group felt much cooler, but the surrounding air and ground became even hotter than before. Loki yelped from the conflicting energies as Alexia tried to push the heat out of her green mate, but the thermal imbalance tried to force the energy to go right back in. EOOE. I'm awake I'm awake. She was on her hooves in a second, glad that her boots separated her from the ground. Toon cut the spell off leaving everyone refreshed and the wind carried most of the boiling air away. Crimson felt a cold induced shiver run down her spine. This can't be a healthy way to cool off. Alexia reformed the sunscreen. I may have been a bit overzealous, she admitted hastily. We need to get off the sand or it might start melting our boots. Not wanting to even question such a claim, the mares ran several meters further along the path while Conrad simply took to the air. He raced to be adjacent to Alexia. We should rest some time soon. We'll be at the location in less than 40 minutes if we resume our original speed. Toon shook her head. We shouldn't let our guard down so close to the objective. There's no telling if they send patrols out or not. Crimson was in agreement and scanned the crest of the dune they were standing beside. We have to assume they do. And we're going to suffer heat stroke if we don't get out of the open soon. Loki took a long drag of water from her camelback. The water was almost scalding her tongue thanks to Alexia's spell work, but the green mare sucked it down anyway until she was panting for breath. You know with all this lack of sweat. I think I miss being furless. But I'm not sure yet. The earth mare's moderately nonsensical phrasing did not go unnoticed, Alexia most of all. In the corner of her vision, 
the alicorn's long bangs hovered low enough that she could see the pink stripe in her hair. For the briefest of seconds, she imagined it fading back to its original azure. We can't linger any more. Eager to see something other than the unending trackless sands, the herd followed after the galloping princess. Anderson's prediction of a heat stroke only confirmed the alicorn's own pressing anxiety. Just hang on a bit longer guys. Conrad and Anderson shared a knowing look with each other as their alpha's distress threatened to become detrimental to her ability to lead. With a nod to the red-haired mare, Conrad pressed forward to be side by side with Toon while Crimson kept an eye on the flagging Loki. Alex is running from more than the Sahara. The Pegasus saw she was suffering emotionally, and could guess at the source. Stop grieving for us when we're still here Alex. He hoped she would not fall apart before he had time to confront her with this, but the mission had to come first. Asterisk. While ever mindful of succumbing to the elements of the merciless desert, Toon was bound and determined to get to the objective. Mercer said the only activity the satellites detected are the irregular deliveries going in and out by cargo truck. I bet they actually don't send patrols because that could be detected. Thirty minutes into the run, Alexia cut off her sunscreen and trudged up the last sand dune. This should give us a view of the target area. The four equines saw the early evening sun cast the small collection of camouflage tarps in a rather anticlimactic light. The facility seemed more like an abandoned World War II supply depot more than anything else. From their ground side view from on top of a smallish sand dune, they were able to peer beneath the camo tarps roughly 250 meters away. The whole area was nestled in a large flat track of sand with only one last dune between the tarps and a vast stretch of flat sand beyond it. At a distance, the depot looked for all the world to be abandoned. Nothing moved save what was disturbed by the dying down winds. Unfortunately details were difficult to come by at such a distance. Conrad and Loki scanned their surroundings and found nothing that would hint at the presence of any patrols or stationary guards. The green mare wanted to get out of the baking sun, but avoiding a bullet wound was also high on her list of priorities. She tapped Toon with a hoof. Place looks empty. What do we do? Alexia's muzzle scrunched in contemplation after shuffling behind the crest of the dune. Intel has it that this place is getting irregularly timed shipments, so it can't be truly abandoned. I bet there are a few traps or alarms if anyone tries to approach the facility. A superior smirk creased her face. Gather up, I'm going to teleport us to that collection of barrels on the far side. The herd huddled around their alpha as the alicorn popped her head back over the dune to get a visual on the supply cache to pick a destination. Better go ahead and weave in my ward against anti-magic fields. The last thing I need is to get cut off. Toon's horn radiated a nearly blinding azure light as she weaved the spell into being. In a flash of blue light and a slight clap of air, the four ponies disappeared from behind the dune and rematerialized in the middle of a large collection of rusting oil drums. Once the nonalicorns recovered from the teleport, they automatically spread out to carefully search the area. The depot was of moderate size. Fuel drums lined the entire perimeter, save for the front gate. The containers were either bone dry, or filled with ruined lubricants. The barrels were typically stacked three high, but several breaks in the form of toppled cans allowed the three searching equines to map the area. Toon remained behind to try and program in a Mayan detection diagram in her harness's computer. The depot had several structures including a single barracks and two separated five-car garages with an additional seven open-air repair stations for tanks. Both former criminals noticed several old vehicles were still present. Three partially broken stripped-down half-tracks sat in the garages while two Tiger tanks sat on the open repair bays. One of the last two structures was an armory that Crimson explored briefly after risking a venture from the fuel drums. It was two stories tall and was still crammed with munitions ranging from tank rounds to small arms and ammunition for the 1088mm anti-aircraft guns that were cooking in the arid climate around the depot. The final structure looked to be the command center, but was structurally unsound thanks to the half-dozen holes left behind by Allied bombing from almost a century ago. There was nothing to suggest that the depot had been touched by anything other than sand save for the very faint single line of tire tracks. 
leading up to the center open space of the depot, but then turning around and leaving. Conrad was the first to return to Alexia with news. He could tell right away that she was having some difficulty getting the holographic diagram working, but he ignored it to give his report. I checked out the garages and the camo tarps. Nothing looks like it's been touched since the war. Tools, engine parts and the garages in general are covered in sand. If there is anyone here, the only sign of it would be the tarps. They look old, but I can't believe the desert wouldn't have ripped some of them off by now. As it is, the entire complex is still fully covered by them. Loki bounced over a tipped-over barrel as the Pegasus was giving more details about the mountings holding the tarps in place. Whoever re-secured them used old pikes and rope and it all looks like it was done by the Germans, but I just don't buy it. Toon nodded as she digested the information. Loki, boot that laptop and write down his findings while you tell me your own. Righto. The green mare was thrilled at finally being in some real shade again, and the wall of fuel drums kept the sand-laced wind from depositing more granules into her fur and mane. She sat on her haunches and spoke while waiting for the computer to wake up. All of the fuel drums here are empty or filled with gunk. There's no way the gas Thompson's intelligence team discovered is being stored in these things. She wrapped a hoof on a nearby empty barrel to emphasize her point. The CC's trashed. It's a wonder the thing is still standing after all this time. The tanks in the yard won't be moving any time soon as the engines and main guns have all been sabotaged, likely from the retreating Germans. Anderson arrived last with a plastic bottle in her mouth as she navigated the toppled barrels with more grace than Loki did. She lowered her head to place the bottle quietly at her Alpha's feet so she could speak. Found this discarded water bottle in the barracks. Alexia used her kinesis to bring it up to her eyes which immediately fell upon the trace of water at the bottom. I know the tarps keep this place relatively cool, but there's no way liquid water could stay for long around here. This means someone was here very recently, Toon replied with a satisfied grin. Excellent find. She turned to Loki. Did Mercer say there's been any recent activity in the area? She shook her head. He didn't say anything, but then again, I didn't ask. Ask, Toon commanded. I will operate under the assumption that there hasn't been unless you tell me otherwise. Loki nodded her understanding and backed away to speak away from the conversation. Toon faced her other two mates. Keep an eye out while I finish this divination diagram. If this is just a meeting place, I need to see if there might be someone still nearby. But I don't want any surprises if someone comes back. Hopefully I'll be able to get the stupid thing done by nightfall. The ponies broke up to leave Alexia in peace while keeping watch over the area. Toon pulled the two electronic styluses out of her pouch again and stared at the infernal things with a glare that could boil paint. I'm so used to drawing on a hard surface that writing on thin air is a serious pain in the flank. Her aching wings had settled down to a dull throbbing discomfort. The silver mare's mastery over her telekinesis was to the point where she could gently massage her stiff muscles while still being able to focus on the two pens. However that was mostly because she was used to drawing arrays with up to ten pieces of chalk at a time. I love the idea of a computer-assisted holographic array, because that will allow me to conjure one up in an instant, but I still have to enter it incorrectly or it's worthless. This is probably just a meeting place and the Mayans are using some other location out in the desert to house the lab itself. She reactivated the hologram with the outer ring appearing a foot in front of her by default so she had a frame of reference. She started painting in the first dozen lines to exacting specifications. But it never hurts to be thorough. I'm going to drop a skin for a five mile radius and see if anything pops up. An hour passed with nothing to do but stand watch as Toon tried to learn how to draw on air. Loki was becoming rather bored at that point as Mercer assured her that nothing had slipped in or out of the facility within the past 12 hours. She looked to her fellow Earth pony for amusement, but Crimson was in the middle of combing her tail. The green mare blinked in dumbstruck amazement for a moment before speaking. You brought a hairbrush with you. Anderson looked up from her work with the grooming implement in her mouth and carefully placed it in a side pocket so she could speak. 
What? There's nothing here. We've triple checked everything and the place is empty. There's not even any footprints around besides our own. I just thought with having nothing better to do than twiddle our non existent thumbs, I'd get rid of some of these tangles. Loki shrugged. I hear ye. I don't know what the mage hopes to find with the array. This is probably just a rendezvous place. She stood up and arched her back to stretch. Conrad had been listening in on the conversation from on top of stacked barrels. Whenever he wasn't flying, he preferred to be on raised platforms or furniture. You guys don't think we might be sitting on top of an underground facility by chance do you? Both mares gave him a quizzical look with crimson huffing in amusement. No one is dumb enough to make an underground complex in sand. That's just stupid. He waved an indignant hoof in the air. You don't honestly believe the desert is nothing but sand between here and the mantle do you? Of course not. But I also know sand is way too unstable for that kind of construction. As her two mates bickered, Loki's tail twitched. She froze for almost four seconds until her tail twitched a second time. She twisted around to grab it in her forelegs. Something's coming. Anderson stopped mid-sentence and both other ponies turned towards Loki. What? The green mare looked at her twitching tail. Something's coming. She let go of the array appendage and jumped up two stacks of barrels to pull Conrad off the stack of barrels and down to the dirt. Hey! He grunted in mild pain and surprise as he hit the ground. He blinked a few times to get his eyes refocused. Give me a warning before you do stuff like that Wujia. Loki's answer came in the form of grumbling machinery under their hooves and the large empty marshalling area opened into a yawning tunnel where a heavy laden flatbed truck grumbled out from underground. The ponies ducked behind the wall of fuel barrels and peeked out from breaks in the drums. They went unnoticed by the driver of the first truck and the three that came after it. As soon as the fourth truck left the broken down security gate, the large trap doors closed back up. A massive fan revealed itself from the sealed-off part of the nearby barracks and kicked up a small dust storm to conceal the doors with a layer of sand. The equines ducked behind the rattling stacks of barrels, trying to protect themselves from the sandstorm. After two minutes, the fan receded back into the barracks and the depot fell silent once more, save for the distant sound of grumbling engines. Conrad popped up from under cover and smirked in the direction of the trap doors and jabbed Crimson in the shoulder. Ha! Huh. Called it. Author's note. I was so tempted to name this chapter Tatooine. End author's note. End chapter 3. SPF 40